Welcome to an overview of the Giza Necropolis. The Giza Plateau is located on the west bank of the Nile and was considered by ancient Egyptians as the domain of the dead. The pyramidal complexes found there were built over the span of three generations during the reign of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara. The Giza area, now famous for its three pyramids, is part of a wider grouping of funerary complexes. Rulers from this period generally elected to be buried in the area. The focal point of the entire region was the city of Memphis, chosen as the capital of Egypt at the beginning of the Old Kingdom. The placement of the Giza monuments, and particularly that of the pyramids, followed a practical yet strict alignment. First, they focused on cardinal points, and then they accounted for the natural geology of the plateau. Welcome to the Riddles of the Sphinx. A Sphinx was originally meant to be a personification of the king. The human head, wearing pharaonic regalia, was fused with the body of a lion, thus sharing the qualities the powerful animal possessed, namely its power, the swiftness of its attack, and its majestic authority. By these very virtues, it was also considered a symbol of protection. Unsurprisingly, statues of sphinxes could be found along the dromas, protectors of the path taken by the gods to reach the temples. Over the centuries, enthusiasts and historians alike have wondered, who built the sphinx? For what purpose? And who does it represent? These questions remain unanswered. Several theories do exist, however, some more credible than others. One theory supposes that Jedifre chose to pay homage to his father Khufu by building the Great Sphinx of Giza. The stone temple on the eastern face of the Sphinx would have been added later on by his brother and successor, Khafre, in order to strengthen the divine worship of their father it would be the first Egyptian temple oriented with the sun. Another theory suggests that the Sphinx was built by Khafre and was meant to represent him. The arguments to support this hypothesis are based on the fact that the limestone beds used for the main work of the temple of the Sphinx are geographically and architecturally similar to the Valley Temple of Khafre. Some believe that Khufu himself built the Sphinx, which was later finished under his successors, Jedifre and Khafre. These arguments are based on the stylistics of the engraving, the typology of the memes, and the absence of a beard at the time of construction. While ancient Egypt as a whole leaves a rather monochrome vision of its monuments and statuary, it is vital to understand that in ancient times, 
absolutely everything was painted. The sun eating away at the pigments of the colors, the sand, the climate, and the implacable impact of time unfortunately destroyed the glorious colors of the Sphinx of Giza. Documents from an Arab Egyptologist of the 12th century, Abd al-Latif al-Baghdadi, indicate that traces of red were still visible in his time. Today, however, the only color that remains are traces of red close to the ears of the Sphinx, as well as hints of blue and yellow on the neems, traditional colors for that type of headdress. The pigments for the color red were man-made, obtained by mixing different products such as clay, quartz sand, and very finely crushed hematite. Red had a strong symbolism in ancient Egypt. It was both the color of life and the color of death. It could represent the sands of the desert or the brilliance of the sun. Red was also associated with the god Seth, vengeful and destructive. The Egyptian word for red, Deshur, is also the word which was used to signify the desert or the royal crown of Lower Egypt. In art, red was also the color used to paint the bodies of men, while yellow was used for women. It is possible that there were also color restoration efforts during the Sayite period about 600 years before Cleopatra's rule as indicated by notes on the inventory stele, discovered in 1858 by Auguste Mariette. It is because of this that the team made the decision to display it with its full range of colors, even though the Sphinx's colors would have likely faded by Cleopatra's time. Dating from the fourth dynasty, approximately 2600 to 2500 BCE, the Great Sphinx of Giza is the oldest and largest Sphinx that we know of. Carved from a natural limestone outcrop, the Sphinx measures 19.8 meters in height, 73.2 meters in length, and 14 meters in width. In order to bring polish to the imposing monument, several blocks of limestone were added after the initial construction phase. Since then, there have been numerous attempts at preservation. The polish present in the game integrates some aspects of modern restoration attempts. The team made this choice to present a more iconic version of the Sphinx of Giza to the player. Today, the Sphinx is called the Terrifying One. This appellation is translated from its Arabic name, Abu al-Hol, which in turn was derived from Baluba in Coptic. The Sphinx as a whole was carved in situ from a natural stone promontory. Its head was built in a limestone peak of the Mukatam plate, and the body was sculpted in the underlying rock layer where it is located. The degradation of the Sphinx is due in particular to wind erosion and the different quality of limestone used in its construction. The level of sodium contained in the groundwater which abuts the stone is also a contributing factor. The natural bedrock is seen through the oblique natural strata of the Sphinx's body that are similar to the surrounding limestone. Since antiquity, people have always believed there was a hidden tomb deep within the Sphinx. It is thought that attempts to plunder the Sphinx began as far back as the first intermediate period. Since then, numerous attempts to pierce the Sphinx's secrets have been carried out, leaving indelible scars upon the monument. Twelve meters long and cut during pharaonic times, another entrance in the back of the Sphinx aroused curiosity. Although Thutmose IV attempted to seal it off, it was possibly reopened by treasure hunters. It was rediscovered by Howard Vise and mapped more recently by Mark Lehner. 
This entrance at the back of the Sphinx leads to different cavities of a few meters each, in directions going inside the statue's body and under the surface. The team has used this opportunity to extrapolate a little more. While there have been no major discoveries pertaining to the Sphinx of Giza in recent years, theories and hypotheses continue to emerge. Without validation provided by archaeological sources, however, they remain unsubstantiated. The first of the main theories as to the Sphinx of Giza's meaning posits that the Sphinx was originally a massive representation of the god Anubis. Its principal arguments are that the head of the Sphinx is disproportionate compared to the size of its body. The second theory believes that the representation of two sphinxes on the stela of Thutmose IV would indicate that another stone sphinx had existed on the site itself, possibly even in paired symmetry on the other side of the Nile. However, neither of these theories can be verified in any way. Several scientific projects using new technologies have been put in place in the past decades. The most important was led by Mark Lehner and his team, who specialize in the study and survey of the Giza Plateau, including the Sphinx site. The mapping made it possible to see the materials used to construct the Sphinx, analyze the different layers of erosion, and figure out the most fragile areas to protect. After a few attempts at giving the Sphinx artistic proportions, the team instead decided to use photogrammetry mapping to faithfully reproduce the proportions of the Sphinx. What the Sphinx of Giza represented during its construction and how the Sphinx was perceived by the Egyptians of the New Kingdom are two very different matters. Originally a representation of the king imbued with the power of the lion, the Sphinx was eventually viewed as a direct representation of the Most Divine. It is theorized that kings of the New Kingdom believed that the Sphinx of Giza was the one who recognized and legitimized the ruler of Egypt. Thus, despite the fact the Sphinx of Giza was partially buried under the sand during his reign, Amenhotep II knew that the monument was of great importance. Amenhotep II built a second temple dedicated for the Sphinx as Horamakhet to pay homage to Khufu and Khafre, his predecessors. It became a common habit for this dynasty to spend time with their royal courts at the Sphinx. Its sanctuary became known as Setepet, the Chosen. Egyptologist Mark Lehner believed that Amenhotep II built a statue of himself anchored between the paws of the Sphinx, likely to legitimize his reign, alongside a stela found by Salim Hassan. Many other pharaohs of this dynasty, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, also left marks of their passage in a similar fashion, sometimes even stripping the stones of nearby temples and pyramids to do so. Amenhotep II's son and successor, Thutmose IV, was a frequent offender. While sleeping between the Sphinx's paws, the future Thutmose IV saw in a dream the god Horamakhet proclaiming his coming accession on the throne of the two lands. This was, of course, on the condition that he remove all of the sand covering the Sphinx, which stood guard as the personification of the god and should thus never be engulfed by the sands of the desert. The 15-ton dream stela built by Thutmose IV to commemorate his dream was discovered by an Italian Egyptologist, Giovanni Battista Caviglia, in 1818, when he undertook the task of freeing the Sphinx from the sand, which had, yet again, covered it. Caviglia was looking for an entrance into the structure of the Sphinx but instead he discovered an open-air chapel and stelas between the paws. Ashes from a ceremony were still present. Protected by sand, they quite possibly were from the last ceremonies in Roman times. Mm -hmm. 
That same year, Cavilia discovered fragments of the Sphinx's beard that had probably been added during the New Kingdom. If many of these pieces are held by museums in Cairo, a fragment is displayed at the British Museum, along with a piece of the ureus that was on the Sphinx's headdress. It is believed this fragment of beard was possibly kept in place thanks to the statue of Amenhotep II, which was supposed to be located under the head of the Sphinx. A popular cultural legend purports that the nose of the Sphinx of Giza was lost during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte to the cannon fire of French soldiers in training. However, engravings from before the time of that campaign already depicted the Sphinx without a nose, indicating that it had been removed before the French campaign. The most plausible hypothesis is based on the research of the German historian Ulrich Harman. During the 1980s, Harman compiled medieval sources written by Arab authors. In doing so, he discovered that the Sphinx was once perceived as a favorable omen, a deity supporting sediment-nurturing floods and crops. Around 1378, a Sufi by the name of Mohammed Saim al-Dar could not stand this vision of the monument and in an iconoclastic act, broke the nose of the Sphinx. According to the texts, he was then hanged and burned between the legs of the Sphinx for his crime. Welcome to Khafre's funerary complex. Since the very beginning of the fourth dynasty, mortuary temples were built adjacent to pyramids on the eastern side. Such a location, facing the rising sun, as well as the world of the living as a whole, held an important symbolic meaning, for it was within the mortuary temple that kings were revived through daily rituals. In its standard form, a mortuary temple was divided into two parts, a front area which consisted of a vestibule and a courtyard, and an area in the back where all sacred elements were located. The back of the temple incorporated several essential features, including an inner sanctuary with a false door, which allowed the soul of the pharaoh to travel between the world of the dead and the world of the living. The largest of all such structures, Khafre's mortuary temple was entirely built with megalithic blocks of limestone from a nearby quarry and encased with granite. Parts of Khafre's mortuary temple, particularly the courtyard walls, are thought to have been decorated with splendid reliefs. However, not a single image of the king has been discovered inside the mortuary temple. Khufu's direct successor, Jedifre, followed the custom which required each king to establish a new site for their funerary accommodation and chose Abu Rawash as his last resting place. When the time came to build his own funerary complex, Khafre, also one of Khufu's sons and the successor to Jedifre, 
broke with tradition and returned to Giza. Not only did Khafre thumb his nose at tradition, but he did so in a way which he hoped would allow him to overshadow his father's most important monument. Khafre's pyramid is smaller than Khufu's. It was cunningly built on a more elevated bedrock layer than the Great Pyramid, making it appear higher than any other pyramid at Giza. Today, Khafre's pyramid is the only one among the three at Giza that still has the upper part of its limestone casing. Considered a most sacred area, the Giza necropolis was strictly defined, both geographically and physically. An eight-meter-thick Tura limestone wall completely surrounded the Great Pyramid. The only way inside would have been through the mortuary temple. From the reign of Sneferu and onwards, the subsidiary pyramid became a common feature within the pyramidal complex. The function of the subsidiary pyramid, however, smaller in size and in height than the royal tomb, remains unclear, though some believe that it was meant to house the Ka of the pharaoh. In mainstream media, the Ka is often defined as the soul of the deceased, the truth is a bit more complicated. Within the ancient Egyptian funerary belief system, the Ka was a component of a living person, which separated itself from the body at the time of death. It represented the deceased's vital essence. In order for the deceased to ascend to a new life, whether in this world or the next, the Ka had to be embodied in a statue and its existence maintained through offerings and rituals. Within Khafre's subsidiary pyramid, a wooden box containing pieces of cedar was discovered by archaeologists. When reassembled, it turned out to be a shrine mounted on a sled. Just as with the solar barges found around Khufu's pyramid, it seems Khafre's shrine and sled were ritually disposed of after his funeral. Welcome to Menkara's Funerary Complex. The dimensions of Menkara's pyramid are much less grandiose. However, unlike its predecessors, Menkara's pyramid shows a great deal of complexity in its internal and external finish. The outside was partially covered in red granite, while the internal walls were richly decorated. This latter innovation would not catch on until the end of the 5th dynasty, when pyramid texts began to adorn the walls.
Menkara's pyramid contains two sloping passages, both located in the northern side of the structure. The upper one was abandoned during the construction phase, whereas the lower one, slightly above the base of the monument, constitutes the real entrance. The lower passage leads to a first room, which, for the first time since the reign of Djoser, is decorated with engraved false doors. While Menkara's pyramid complex was unfinished at the time of his death, it was hastily and somewhat shabbily completed by his successor, Shepsikov. Even so, this funerary structure marks a watershed in the history of this kind of monument. From then onwards, the pyramid shrank, whereas the mortuary temple expanded both in its quantitative and qualitative aspects. Of particular note, it is within Menkara's mortuary temple that one can find the heaviest block of limestone ever used for a pyramid complex, weighing in at over 200 tons. <coughs> Menkara's causeway was completed in mud brick by the king's successor, whereas the lower part was nothing more than a simple ramp. As for the Valley Temple, it was built in two phases. The foundations were first laid out in limestone during Menkara's reign, but the temple itself was completed in mud brick afterwards. As such, the Valley Temple was soon damaged and ended up being completely rebuilt during the Sixth Dynasty. Three small structures, referred to as Menkara's Queen's Pyramids, were erected along the southern side of the main pyramid. One of them was a smooth-faced pyramid, while the other two were more basic step pyramids. It is difficult to assess whether the latter were designed as such or were left unfinished with no casing to smooth out their surfaces. The easternmost pyramid was built with the traditional rooms and corridors found within a satellite pyramid meant to house the king's ka. However, a granite sarcophagus was found within, leading to the conclusion that it was used as an actual tomb rather than as a symbolic cenotaph. Drawing on these observations, some assume that this pyramid was first built as a satellite pyramid for the king's ka before seeing its purpose change to that of a queen's tomb. Which queen, however, remains a mystery. Mm -hmm.